I think we have uh, not very much time to cover a lot of topics here, so we're going to try to try to move things along as quickly as we can here, save time for questions or discussion if we can. Uh, so I, I'm not going to cover uh, what the title of the, the panel is here. Uh, I think Al Schuldner did a good job of covering what needs to be said, I think, from the perspective of the Media Bureau. Uh, since I'm, I work in OET, I've, I'm going to cover a different perspective here. I'm going to cover a little bit of the background of where we are in terms of some of the technical rules that are associated with FM coverage and, and prediction of interference. Uh, so I'm going to go through uh, 20 slides here and hopefully 10 minutes or less. Uh, and just another disclaimer there on the bottom that you know anything I say today isn't necessarily held as a view of the commission. So um, just quickly here, uh, rules that you, you probably all are familiar with is the, the 73215 protections. Uh, the bottom line here, if you don't know what, what these represent, uh, there are different protections for different classes of FM stations and all of the coverage and protections uh, are based on F5050 coverage and all of the interfering uh, thresholds are based on F5010. So what does all of this mean? Uh, this, this may be a bit of a review for, for especially for the radio scientists in the room or, or any other consulting engineers. Uh, but so the F5010 or 5050 in the case of coverage interference uh, represents percent of locations and percent of the time. So what we're talking about is the percent of time or locations that a signal exceeds a certain threshold. Uh, so for desired signals or, or protected signals, uh, we want them to be reliably received. So what we're talking about is that we want to establish a time percentage such as the median that the signal is reliable. So what we're talking about in the case of F5050 is that it's typically receivable at those locations. Undesired signals, uh, we want those to be re received less frequently, so we, set a, we set a less lesser time percentage for those, so we're talking about F5010 or 10% of the time, so the signals are supposed to be exceeded for no less than, no more than 10% of the time in those cases. Uh, also on the slide, there were some DDU ratios uh, described, and so what that sort of looks like is that if I had a hypothetical receiver shown in orange there, uh, it would have the ability to receive the desired signal and reject any of the unwanted signals on the co-channel first or second adjacent channels there. Uh, just to, to recap those numbers, that's what, we're, what we mean when we're talking about all this stuff. So that's the first step is establishing these numbers and these limits. Um, so how do we come about uh, the, the geographic component of this is where, where are those signals supposed to be received? So we're moving now to propagation curves and, and how, how the signals are predicted. So here's a, a, an example of a, of a contour. So it sort of looks like a circle and it uh, extends at different distances from the transmitter site in different directions. Uh, and so we're going to talk about a little bit about how that, those uh, distances are derived. So going through the basics here, theoretical basics, you've got uh, free space propagation, something like the sun in space you, goes out as an inverse square law. So it's proportional to 1 over r squared because the surface of a sphere is, one or, is 4 pi r squared. And then you've got uh, other situations such as line of sight propagation where you've got constructive and destructive addition of signals. And so you get an effect that's sort of shown at the bottom of the slide there. Uh, and then you've got other propagation effects such as refraction where the radio waves have a tendency to bend along with the curvature of the Earth. Uh, but there are other situations where refraction can have the radio waves bend away from the Earth or get trapped in ducts that travel along the Earth. And you have other propagation phenomena such as diffraction where you have knife edge such as a mountain where the waves uh, are, are bent around a mountain and received on the other side or uh, bent around the earth in, in a diffraction case. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, you know when we're talking about trans horizon paths they tend to uh, be attenuated at worse than one over r squared or, or line of sight uh, propagation conditions. Um, how much is, is the subject of the next couple of slides here. Uh, so here's just a typical path. This is uh, out of the NTIA report 82100 that shows a couple of regions of propagation here. You've got free space, line of sight, diffraction, and scattering regions. And that would be a, a normal propagation path there. And so just to, to summarize some of the propagation stuff, 
you know, you've got various fac factors that affect propagation. You've got reflection, multipath, refraction, scattering, diffraction, all these different types of phenomena that occur at different time intervals. Uh, so you could take all of these different things and predict them. And it could be expensive. It could uh, require a lot of different uh, inputs, such as weather data and things like that. And it could be, could be costly. Or uh, in the case of what, what the FCC had done with the propagation curves, you just sort of aggregate it all together uh, with long-term statistics and measurements and, and just assume a certain receiver height and, and characteristics. And, and you end up with uh, uh, curves that represent a, a typical situation. So here's an example of that. Um, so you've got uh, long-term measurements that were done in sort of the FM frequency band there over time, and you've got propagation statistics over the bottom that span between 0.01% of the time and 99.9% .9 of the time. These measurements were done in, based on a report in 1971. And you take these measurements and, and put them together, and you can look, look at a lot of different look at them in a lot of different ways. This is from NBS Tech Note 101 that was published in 1967. The important things here is, as you'll see in uh, the 10 percent or 90 percent range here, that the the statistics can vary from the median by as much as plus or minus 10 dB, uh, depending on the path. Uh, so here's probably some some charts that you're all familiar with. Uh, so just a couple of examples here. If I have a class A FM station that's 6 kilowatts effective radiated power, uh, 100 meters height above average terrain, it uh, goes out about uh, 28 kilometers if you're using the F5050 propagation curves. A couple of other examples, if you switch curves from 5050 to 5010 for the same contour, it goes out two more kilometers. Or if you take a more practical example, if you take the 20 dB DDU co-channel uh, protection criteria, and you, you look at F5010, it goes out about 80, 87 kilometers. So what happens if your uh, propagation paths aren't typical? Um, so some of the FCC rules allude to some of this. Uh, in this case, we're talking about terrain roughness. If, if your path is, is not typical, the FCC rules allow for terrain roughness factors to be applied in certain situ situations. Uh, an example of this is uh, 1997. Um, the Media Bureau released some guidance about uh, alternative showings for community of coverage uh, license showings, uh, that if your terrain departs widely from the average, uh, that is, if it's uh, worse than, I think it's 10, 10 or 20 meters, or uh, greater than 100 meters, whereas the typical is 50 meters, um, then you're allowed to use this alternative method, and you show a map of uh, where your uh, transmitter is in relation to the community of license, and I think I have an example of that on the next slide here. So uh, the 70 dB microvolt per meter community coverage uh, compared to a community here that shows the Longley Rice coverage covers the whole community, whereas the contour doesn't quite cover the whole community. And this is an example of the path there. Um, another <clears throat> alternative uh, propagation method is uh, found on OET's webpage. We have a program called TV Study, and it has a very lengthy disclaimer that says that you can't really use this for official use for FM uh, propagation prediction. Uh, but that said, it, it does have the features built into it. And uh, if you compare here uh, the, the F5050 coverage contour and uh, Longley Rice contour, you'll see that there are many areas where the contour would show that there is service, but the Longley Rice does not, such as in this area. And then you have areas where the inverse happens, where you have no service here, but the, the Longley Rice does. So hopefully I didn't fly through that too quickly. But in summary here, um, we've got coverage contours that define the protection areas for FM stations. Uh, and the interfering contours, they, they provide the basis for protection against um, other FM stations. And um, interference and coverage are um, described by the, the thresholds uh, in the rules uh, for signal strength as well as the DDU ratios. And short-term propagation statistics can have uh, a profound effect on, on the signal strength depending on the situation. Um, contours are, are a simple method to uh, predict something that's otherwise very complex. Um, and other models do exist. Um, hope that's a pretty quick rundown there. So, any questions? No, we'll, we'll hold questions okay. for later. Sure, yeah. thanks. Okay.
needs to click on yeah. I hope so. They don't work with it. That's. Do you want that one again? Oops. Let's try that. And we have a clicker. Let's see if it works. Look at that. All right. We go. Uh, I'm Sam Wallington, as uh, Glenn mentioned. Thank you, Mike. I don't. Is your power on? Helps. We turn it on. <laughs> Test. I don't think uh, we've got a green light, but no, uh, nothing else. So you want to? Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, and it's, uh, I have my Cooney CTO for Beasley. Uh, Go ahead. Um, first off, a little about us, uh, pretty self-explanatory from the screen. Um, our purpose of showing this is to show you that um, both us as broadcasters have very vested interest in both full power stations and in translator signals. And, uh, so I'd... Go ahead. One of the statistics that's pretty interesting is that translators now outnumber full power stations, and it's still growing. So this is the reason, I think, that this topic has come up. So I wanted to take you back in time for just a moment uh, and do a little history. Uh, a while back, I don't remember the date, uh, the NAB put together an ad hoc committee on translator interference, and uh, Mike and I were privileged to be on that committee. Um, particularly, again, because of our position as both station and translator owners. So the committee went through uh, a bunch of things. There was representatives from a bunch of companies, uh, I think it was eight or 10 different companies, different perspectives, uh, both engineering and management. So really trying to look at this translator situation and uh, decide if there's something to do about it. Um, Agreed on a number of proposals, and if you want to know what those are, simply read NAB's filing that eventually generated the uh, FCC's NPRM, or would contributed to, I should say. So that uh, committee put together the list that ended up being um, the NAB's filing, which generated the NPRM. And I think uh, what we learned after a lot of uh, painful meetings was that we could come to an agreement on, uh, for the most part, everything in the recommendations uh, except for the contour protection that came out in the NPRM, the 54 dBU contour. Uh, many of us uh, you know, couldn't come to an agreement on that. And uh, I guess the first thing I would say about that is we, uh, most of us who uh, purchased, I'll just speak for Beasley here on this case, um, when we went out and bought translators, we bought them with the idea that we knew they were a non-protected service and we did not look at them as anything that ever would be protected. And we built them accordingly, we paid for them accordingly, knowing that they were non-protected service, so we didn't really want a protected contour, even though we had 29 translators that we'd invested millions of dollars in. Yeah, and same for, same for EMF. Uh, we generally um, wanted it to stay fair. We honestly liked the way the rule worked in many ways in that uh, any translator could be potentially at risk um, because it protects the stations and the long-term integrity of the band. So as the NPRM came out, um, we generally, um, can I anyway, agreed with the uh, NPRM except for the contour question which uh, definitely raised some, some big challenges. Um, as was already mentioned, uh, contours are really effective for large-scale things like allocation of signals. Um, the reality is the difference between that um, F5010 interfering contour at 40 dB uh, is a lot different than the protected F5050 at 60. That has created, over many years of the allocation process uh, re being repeated over and over, an area of de facto protection for full power stations. 
where translators were unable to really um, interfere because of those uh, rules that protected them. Um, the challenges um, that Martin already mentioned, um, the um, contours have the challenge of being uh, less accurate as you get past 16 kilometers because you're no longer paying attention to terrain. So that mountain at 17 um, is not considered. Or the great uh, elevation change that suddenly makes your signal much uh, stronger because you're higher uh, is, is ignored. And also it ignores some of those small terrain features that are perhaps between radials. So here's an example. Uh, this was put together by uh, Bert Goldman. Um, he sends his regrets that he couldn't make it this time. Um, this shows a theoretical station in the Sacramento, California market. Uh, as you can see, the contours there, I don't know if you can read them all. The, in, the smallest contour is 60 dBU, F5050, followed by 54, 48, and 30, I think that says 8. Um, and uh, so those are the four contours. Look at the Longley Rice predictions, and the parameters are up in the corner for because uh, this is the room for knowing what those mean. Um, you can see that the 60 dB coverage extends well beyond that black 60 dB contour. That's an area that's uh, very usable for a translator, but also is reality coverage for the full power station. So I could build a stage of a full power translator in Sacramento, and I would wipe out that coverage. Uh, and I could potentially do it legally. So that's one of the reasons that Mike and I have um, expressed some of our concerns about that. No, that was a good explanation. Um, and then, uh, as he mentioned, also the point-to-point -point or, or Longley Rice type models uh, where we do consider all the terrain, they can be quite accurate. Um, they do present some interesting challenges. My first reaction to the NPRM is, hey, well, let's do Longley Rice. Um, but the reality is that there are some areas, and I have this lovely example. This is a, a fringe coverage area with interference from uh, three different stations. Who's at fault at your house? <laughs> it starts getting really interesting, especially uh, with one of the Commission's stated goals of trying to um, make it easier and more predictable and uh, more manageable for folks. Our opinion is the 54 dBU contour limit uh, is not the right standard. And we'll uh, comment some more on some more maps here. But um, as part of uh, what we agreed to, a, a group of us in uh, our filing, which was Beasley, iHeart, Cox, Intercom, Radio One, and a few other small broadcasters, uh, first off, I should mention my boss, um, Caroline Beasley, went to the commission and met with them three times to try and get you know, to try and point across our concerns, both representing the NAB, where she's the chairman, and also representing Beasley. And as a group um, of those broadcasters that I just mentioned, we came up and we agreed to a, a number of 42 dB that we put in our filing. We thought we could live with if we had to have a number. Like I said, we didn't want a number, but if we had to, it was going to be 42. I think as we go through some of these slides, you'll see why we said that. So uh, this is one of my stations. Um, we showed, uh, this is actually in our filing if you want to see it. Um, the interior orangish contour is the 54 uh, F5050. That scattergram is donors uh, and other contacts to our station. Um, so you can see that we have a lot of people that live outside the 54 that are working on those things. Um, if you notice to the southwest, uh, there is a, a reduced, and that's because we have overlap with another station. We eliminated all duplicate contours here, or, or uh, uh, people, so that there's no confusion. So this is looking from the other side, going down the coast here just a little bit. This is the Philadelphia station that we eliminated with those uh, overlapping dots from. And you can see it's not limited to individual stations that this kind of thing happens. So I took this station, I plugged it into uh, vSoft software, and uh, here is the uh, map of interferers to our station. So the white area is area that you should be able to hear us without interference. And uh, let's uh, add people to that. So you can see there's a lot of folks that live outside of the 54, which is the outer contour. Um, and be able to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, okay. you're doing a good job. And uh, <laughs> here's a different one. This is up in Milwaukee. Um, same idea. As you can see, just because of uh, population locations, we don't have as many that are as far out. Uh, again, here's the um, interferers. 
And if we add some people in there, look up to the north of the signal. There's a whole lot of people that can no hear it with no interference. Uh, this is an interesting case. This is uh, one of our stations in Central California. Um, the interferer on the north is completely inside our 60. Um, it's because they were there first. And the way contours work sometimes creates these interesting things because of uh, terrain, uh, as we were pointing out earlier. City of Bakersfield obviously is the market that uh, I care about. So there's the people. Now let's uh, look at this a different way. This is my uh, un non-interference, my interference-free coverage. And as you can see, I have pretty decent coverage of Bakersfield. Let's add those people back in. And it works pretty well. But the reason I brought it this one is it's interesting to see how the actual coverage is offset quite a bit from the contour. Again, just because of terrain and the way interference works. Uh, this is a slide that I put together um, with the help of uh, Jeff Littlejohn and data from we paid for a study with Nielsen to look at in-home and out-of-home listening, and these are 12-plus uh, ratings, uh, and we did it for the top, all, every PPM market. I didn't, I'm not allowed to show anything but ours, so I wanted to give a good example of here. If you look down at the bottom of, this is, these are all three Class A's of ours, and they're the only Class A's we really own. Um, we're losing somewhere... Oh, the, like DHA down below would lose 34.7% uh, of their listeners are outside the 54 DBU, 38.9% for um, RAT, the RAT, and something a little less than that for the others. But it goes to show you how vastly this could affect a Class A's as opposed to some of the bigger Class C's. And then just quickly on the, uh, I took those two stations, WDHA and RAT, and uh, did the same treatment with them, just kind of looking at what is the predicted coverage. Again, there's quite a bit outside the 54. Uh, if I flip it around and look at the interferers, Looks and then like finally put the population, yeah, it gets kind of messy, doesn't it? Uh, but if you look on the tip of Long Island here, just south of New York, see that little white blob? There's a lot of people there. <laughs> so moving on to the uh, rat. Same kind of idea, there's the interferers, throw the people in. Um, if you look southwest, that's probably the biggest chunk of folks who are living in that out outer area. Let me back up here, sorry about that. Anything else you want to add about? No, just okay. All right, so uh, this was something that uh, uh, Jeff Littlejohn contributed to the joint filing that, that Mike and uh, those folks did that show the number of uh, their audience based on QM. Uh, outside those contours. So uh, as you can see, at the 60, it's about 24%. As we drop off to the 54, it's 13%. This is aggregated all over all of iHeart signals. So all, uh, PPM, uh, PPM, all PPM. Thank you. All yes, PPMs. correct. Um, and again, we're, not, we're trying not to show individual signals because, you know, rarely is that okay. <laughs> but uh, just to give you an idea, uh, I did the same thing based on our donor records from last year. Um, so you can see the curve is very similar. I've started at 54 on this. I didn't go out to the 60. Um, and if I overlay the two, uh, I apologize. The lines are a little thin there, but you can get the idea that there are fewer donors than listeners. You'd kind of expect that. Um, but the curves are very similar. So as you follow this off to the right, you start seeing that somewhere around, oh, I don't know, about the 37%, 30, or 38 dB contour, somewhere around there, that's where we drop as an aggregate below 1% of our audience. Um, if we move over a little bit to the left, um, the 42 is kind of where we all settled is saying, yeah, okay, I think we can afford to lose maybe 2%. Yeah, and that's, as you can see, I mean, no one really wants to lose 2.6% of the listeners. It just so happens, I'm trying to remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I know for the Beasley numbers, we had, um, like 2.6 million outside the 54 DBU contour, and then at the 42, we, one thing, one advantage, we do have some really, really good signals that tend to be in the center of the market. So our, our number compared to the upper left there is around 7% of our listeners are in the 54, outside the 54. Um, but still, even with that, we would, even at 42, we still lose a lot of listeners. Yeah. So I wanted to talk for just a moment, uh, kind of a beyond the NPRM thing, um, just to wrap up here. Um, as Mike mentioned, translators are risky. Um, I would love it if people paid accordingly. 
Uh, there are some translators out there that are listed at, I would call, eh, well, let's just say very expensive. Um, when someone buys a translator at that price, they have a lot invested and it's going to matter a lot. So just beware as you do consulting work, as you do those other things, make sure that we kind of sell that fairly. That even though this might be protected, I have a translator from the late 80s that's still on the air, works great it, because it's protected by a second adjacent station. Um, there are those cases where you can do that, but with Co and First Channel, it, it's, it's very difficult uh, to make them coexist long term. Uh, the last thing I think I would, I would add is um, we as an industry, I think, need to learn to cooperate. Um, I love it when a station owner calls me and says, your translator is causing problems because then I have a chance to deal with it and I, don't have, I can spend a lot of money on engineering instead of on lawyers. <laughs> and it saves uh, my friend here a lot of time as well. Um, so call me if, you, if one of my translators causes a problem and I'll try to do the same. Uh, we've done some creative things for translator owners. I recognize whether they're an AM owned or just a standalone translator that's you know, trying to survive in a very difficult universe. Um, and I've helped them out. I'll, I'll buy them a directional antenna. I'll do the engineering work to help the channel. Uh, I'll file their app if they ask me to um, because I happen to have those resources and I can help. And it, ultimately, we both win because I get that translator off my channel or off causing problems for me quicker and cheaper than if we fight it out in court for a long time. So that's it for me. I don't no, know. That, that was well put. Martin, do you have anything to add? No. Okay, we're open for questions. It's a panel. So. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, one, two, test. Oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> Hello, one, two there. I, uh, I had several cases of translator interference when, I, when a station put, on, put a, uh, a um, a uh, translator on the air market considerably far away from a co-channel class C. And um, it didn't take long till the letters came in. And got about six or seven or eight letters and the station owner got suspicious. And he took a, dr a drive and he found two of the letters were from station uh, employees. Two houses were un unoccupied, nobody lived there. And the other two he couldn't find. And in fact, and I've, I have done other cases, that is another real problem. There is, there, I agree with what you're saying. I don't, I don't think I agree with 42. For, uh, but uh, uh, if that part of the problem is the most difficult to solve because the, these people are just creating a mess. And there's, I know of one in this market that uh, uh, still isn't resolved, partly because of the fact the rulemaking came out. So I, I appreciate hearing some comments about that issue about uh, the fake, the fake uh, complaints. Uh, you may want to speak more to this uh, because it is one of the reasons, stated reasons behind the NPRM is to try to simplify this to make that go away. Uh, there's a lot of gaming going on, um, you know, and we could add a, our stories of um, translator owners uh, paying off our listeners to go away, stuff like that. So. Now, I have to say that when I was at CBS, one of the things that I had to uh, moderate was the attempt by our stations to generate letters and we didn't allow that to happen and that that's a problem i, I agree with you. do you have one more thing larry i, I just want to comment that the, the fcc staff sent a, a, a very strong the fcc staff sent a very strong emanation to the attorney for that station and, and he, they came almost uh, being blackballed from filing applications from uh, for uh, uh, type of any more work with the commission. Just pass it on to the next person, Larry. <clears throat> Carl. Carl. A couple things. Um, the 42 dBU is kind of interesting. Um, that's a number I've, I've used in recent years uh, without a whole lot of technical backup. Um, but back in around 19, in the early 1990s, I did a uh, I did a paper on optimizing uh, power versus height at one of the NAB conventions. And the, contour, the signal level that I used in preparing that paper was 48 dBU. And 48 dBU was based on the aggregation of a bunch of receiver data and defining the 6 dB stereo separation point, and that's the number I came up with. So that, that's just, I, I throw that out just as, as, even though it's a long time ago, 
that's a, that's a a number that has uh, it had at the time um, kind of an electronic basis for it. I see where you're, you're going with the 42 derived on on, on user statistics, and, and that certainly has some validity uh, validity as well. Um, second thing I'll point out, and you may remember me mentioning this in one of the RTC meetings, is uh, before I retired from Univision, I often looked at translator applications and uh, their potential to cause interference to Univision stations. And what I found in doing this was many of them uh, had were predicted to have no usable, virtually no usable service at all because of incoming interference. And I think that one of the, one step the commission's probably reluctant to do that could could head off a lot of the trouble is uh, for there be to be a minimum uh, interference-free service standard for the translator itself. Yeah. To the first point, um, there was a study done in the 70s about that concept, and one of the challenges there um, is the definition of do people really want the stereo carrier? I think the other number that they used was uh, low 40s, 41 something. I can't remember the details of the study. It was something from the 70s. So definitely on that. Did you have a question, Ted? Did you want to? I'll wait. Um, uh, Come in with the mic. Right. I'm behind you. All right, the, um, the, the one thing that I think isn't being covered that extends where protection of full service stations should probably extend beyond any number is if it's a station that is, shall we say, at one side of a, of an, of a rated market. Of a what market? Of rated. a rated market. Oh, okay. So in other words, if a, if a station is within a rated market and there's identified interference within that market, that should count no matter what. Uh, the second thing that I do want to point out is I personally investigated some uh, reported, uh, uh, reported uh, listener complaints, and it turned out that the radio station had run a remote from a, from a uh, um, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, a shopping center well outside anywhere that a mobile around could uh, could just pick up a reliable signal. And they had a 30-foot boom and a Yagi, and they had big speakers. And they mostly told people, you're not going to be able to get this wonderful radio station. And they handed out T-shirts. Yeah. So um, there, there have definitely been abuses. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to give Mike, before we go with the next question, I'd like to give Mike one moment to comment because he has yeah. a classic story on this. Yeah. Are you, I assume you're talking about the Philadelphia one or which one? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that is the classic one. Yeah. Well, actually, there's two of them. Oh. Um, are you talking about the one where they paid the listeners? That's or are you right. talking about? Well, <laughs> yes. I have two, actually. But so in, uh, in uh, Fort Myers Market, as an example, we had, uh, we had severe interference from a new translator that went on. And we called them, and, and they turned off right away. And then I think it was a period, of months or several months later, all of a sudden it showed back up. And when we talked to them, they said, "Well, we uh, we've decided that you know we can get this done. You know that, that the commission basically won't do anything about this. So you know go ahead and sue us or whatever." So we filed against it. It's still going on to this day. I think it's been a year and a half. But they actually. Um, we found out, and I thought it was a big deal, we found out proof that they had been paying the listeners between $50 and $150 to, to give up their complaints. And the commission ruled that that was okay. And uh, so I think you heard Al talk the other day at lunch, and he, he mentioned this because they realized that you know it may not have been in, in the past that that was okay, but it's not going to probably be okay anymore. But <laughs> but they're still on the air and still interfering with us at this moment. Second thing I want to say real quick, Beasley, we truly we try to do things you know and look at it from both sides. And so as part of the AM revitalization, we received a license to put the only translator on the air in Philadelphia as part of the AM uh, project, and uh, it was going to cover around a million people and we put it on, put it on a building. And uh, within two days, we we got interference complaints from Town Square. And it was a station, we were probably outside their 40 deep on tour, but they were valid complaints, valid listeners.
turned it off and we turned in the license. And I, you know, I think I don't think you can have it both ways. I mean, you gotta, you gotta. That's the way we look at. It. Any more questions? I think. Oh wait, we got. Just a quick question. Over to are you uh, seeing interference issues because yeah. of the people that are directional translators that aren't following any set rules to meet those parameters? Are you seeing any issues with that affecting the full service or other stations? Are you getting are the complaints tied into that? or uh, We've had a few, shall we say, horrible windstorms that must have reoriented the antenna. <laughs> 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 and uh, they go away while I'm looking and then they come back, you know, uh, yeah, wow. that, that definitely happens that you have those, uh, shall we say, creative directional comp compass issues, you know, I don't know. And they use the towers to optimize it, you know. Say again. A lot of these ones, they're not directional at all. They have direct pattern, they just right. Yeah, I'm, I'm fighting one right now that shall remain nameless that uh, I'm pretty sure that most of the time they're running roughly 10 times uh, power um, and non-directional instead of directional. Yep. And we have more questions up here. You want to, uh, Mike, um, excuse me, uh, Dan, back in the back. One of the concerns I have with translator interference into FMs is that have interference areas along a major thoroughfare that affect a great number of people, but none of them for long enough that they'd be interested in filing an interference complaint or be subjected to some of the badgering from the translator owners about uh, withdrawing that complaint. Yeah, the, uh, the dots on the uh, kind of bluish gray maps uh, definitely are residences. They are not driving. Uh, driving is absolutely an issue. Um, if you've tried to resolve interference with a driving situation, it can be a lot harder. The antenna seems to move. I don't know why. I think that the FCC rules actually do not cover interference to mobile devices, mobile ve to vehicles. Right. Specifically exclude anything but residences. <laughs> Valid point. He said, he said if you didn't hear it, that's where the most listening is. Merrill, did you have a question? Just a quick comment. Um, the same kind of thing that you've been describing goes on with low-power television. Um, I've, I've seen some where somebody seems to have confused east with south. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any more questions? Well, thanks to our panelists. Uh, we have to... Uh, uh, we're going to stand up here for a picture. Thank you for everyone. Hey, listen, thank you everyone for coming to the uh, symposium.